just to zoom out into the ridiculous questions as we were talking about aliens, mm. there's a, a lot of people trying to understand, trying to study the origin of life. Oh, I love this. First of all, what do you think is life versus non-life? Like when you look at like ants or even like the simplest, simplest of organisms, we saw a frog in a stream yesterday that was like a leaf frog. It was like mm. as flat as a sheet of paper and it does a lot of weird things. And it found a way to exist in this world. But that's a single living organism with a bunch of components to it. But the, there's a life form that exists in this world. What is the difference between that and a rock? What, what, is, like, what is the essence of that life? And this might be an un unanswerable question. There's probably a chemistry, physics, biology way of answering that. Like, wh what to you is that? I, I, I think to me, li life is something that grows in response to stimuli. Like in basic biology 101, I think, and I'm fine with that. I don't need it to be more romantic than that. But I think it's actually comical how, how do you get from a rock to an orangutan? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and our answer for that is primordial soup. Maybe there was just stuff on earth and then the, the, the stuff just got up and started walking maybe there just there was nothing happening and then there was all of a sudden there was a cell mm -hmm. and the cell had function and then it complexified and then it started reproducing and found male and female parts and and what like it, we, we are so un under equipped to understand how the hell we got here let alone ants or or, or even bacteria i see this so many uh in very simple mathematical models like something called game of life their cellular automata you could see from simple rules and simple objects when they're interacting together as you grow that system complex objects arise like that emergence of complexity is not understood by science by mm. mathematics at all and it seems like from primordial soups you can get a lot of cool shit and the force of getting from soup to like two humans on microphones. Yeah. Uh, not understood. And it seems to be a thing that happens on earth. I tend to think that it's a thing that happens everywhere in the universe. And there's some deep force that's pushing this along in some way that there's something we, uh, I don't want to sort of, uh, simplify it but there is something that creates complexity out of simplicity that we don't quite understand uh and that's the thing that created the first organism living organism on earth that like leap from no life to life on earth that's a weird one that's a weird one because you can imagine i think that what the earth is four four point five billion years old and you can imagine just this this rock of a planet with like rain and storms and elements and iron and granite and like just random stuff. It's pretty easy to imagine that. But then I remember that book that we think we all had the same book when we were kids. And then like they show this like fish like animal crawling out of a, mm -hmm. out of the primordial soup. And it's like, bro, you just missed the most important part. Author of that book, bro. And and I think the first bacteria came in around three, three, three point seven billion years ago. So there's like at least like, you know, a bunch of billion years where there's just nothing. It was just yeah. a planet. And then we start seeing fossils of the first bacteria. Mm -hmm. And the bacteria stuck around for long time. Oh, for a long time, a billion, two billion years. It's just very, very long. Just bacteria. Just bacteria. But a lot of them. A lot of them. Wow. There's probably a lot of innovation, a lot of murder. A lot of interaction. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, there's there's a bit, a few big leaps along the history of life on Earth. Yeah. You know, the predator-prey dynamic, that was yeah. a really cool innovation. It's almost like innovation. It's like features yeah. on an iPhone. It's like, it's nice. Like uh, predator-prey, <laughs> uh, eukaryotes, so co complex multicellular organisms uh, emerging from the water to land. That was weird. That was a... That was yeah. an interesting innovation. There's how, whatever led to humans, that 
there's a lot of interesting stuff there. I see. I can't even get that far. I can't get from rock and sand to cells. Yeah. That's, that's a huge, yeah. I mean, I mean, to everything around us that has cells is just, it's, it's wild. Even again, and I, I could imagine being on another planet and how incredibly valuable this thing would be. This, this, it's impossible mm -hmm. to replicate. It, I'm looking at it through the candlelight right now, and I can see all of the structures in this leaf, the incredible structures in this leaf that look exactly like the veins in my arm, which look mm -hmm. exactly like the rivers that are flowing across this landscape. And it's like life has this, this overwhelming pattern that it uses, and it's mm -hmm. so beautiful. I just, I just think it's, yeah. When it, when you imagine the, the 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 days of the lightning and the volcanoes and the primordial soup, it's it's there's a there's a big gap there and it's it's fascinating to think about and it's fascinating to see how different people's belief systems uh lead them to different answers there not to give any spoilers but postcard from earth or darren aronofsky's film the idea there is, is there's probes that are sent out from earth oh, that's so to cool. all these other planets and each probe contains two humans a man and a woman uh -huh. and those two humans are in love so they think of a couple in love, they're sent there with all the information, basically a leaf that holds the information of what it takes to create life on other planets, uh, to recreate on Earth and other planets. And the two humans hold all the information for the things that make life on Earth special, especially in human civilization is love, consciousness, mm -hmm. the, the, the social connection. So all that information is sent in the probe. And the postcard from Earth is uh, those humans waking up, remembering all the information that is Earth. That, Whoa. like a celebration of all the things that make Earth magical throughout its history, all the diversity of organisms, all of that. You're loading all that in to create life on that new planet, which is something I think alien civilizations are doing. They're sending probes all throughout the galaxy, and they just haven't arrived yet. But anyway, that's another. Uh, that's so beautiful. And one of the things that I, I think I, I, I want to see that so much. And one of the things that I love about Aronofsky's work is, is the fountain. Mm -hmm. And what I find so beautiful about that is that now here he's saying, okay, we're sending probes out to other worlds, mm -hmm. alien civilizations. And in the fountain, it was sort of what I thought he did so beautifully was braid together those three stories where in one, I don't remember if he's in a spaceship or if, if that's supposed to be like his soul. Mm -hmm. The other one, he's a scientist in sort of like comparable times to ours and then he's the, the the spanish explorer but either way there's the tree of life and it sort of braids together all of the major religions and it made me think of that quote that you hear where it says you know oh god what was it um christ wasn't a christian and buddha wasn't a buddhist and muhammad wasn't a muslim they were all just teachers who were teaching love and it's like the fountain the fountain sort of says nature is the, that driving force. And it's our job to understand that the game is love. And that's what, that's what the main character in the fountain needs to learn is that it's, that it's nature that's going to just, that's going to carry your soul through this, this, this thing. And that there's so much you don't understand in the epiphany at the end. God, I love that movie. God, I love that. Movie. Among many things, you're also an artist is trying to convert the thing that is nature into a thing that we humans can understand. The complexity, the beauty of it. That's what Darren Arnowski tried to do with those couple of films. That's something that I hope you do. Actually, in the medium of film, too, that would be very interesting. And you do that in the medium of books, currently. Um, how much do you think we understand about the history of life on Earth? I think we got it all wrong. <laughs> no, I don't know. It seems like they change it all the time. You know, they say, they say that Easter Island, you know, when I was in college, they were big on telling you that Easter Island, they ruined their environment and... Uh, the environmental collapse. And that's why there was nobody on Easter Island. It was a cautionary tale. We could ruin our environment. And now it seems like they've changed their mind on that. And then when humans entered North America seems to be hugely up to speculation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the Africa spreading that we all spread out of Africa and then the, the Pleistocene overkill extinction theory. And it's like, it seems like every few years they update it and they change it and they say, oh, the guys, no, 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 no. The guys from 10 years ago, actually my mm -hmm. new theory is the best theory. Let's write some books and get me on Letterman. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there's a new prevailing theory that's really always exciting and edgy about 
how how we got here and where we came from and how we dispersed and maybe even has some political implications like mm -hmm. how we should use the amazon moving forward like the amazon was engineered by people so fuck it let's just cut it down yeah it's i, I tend to believe that we mostly don't understand anything but there is an optimism in continuously figuring out the puzzle of that. Sure. I, I, we, we offline talked about the the graham hancock flint dibble debate mm. Uh, on on Rogan, I like debates personally. Yeah. So Flint Dibble represents mainstream archaeology, and I actually like the whole science, the whole field of archaeology. You're trying to figure out history with so little information. You're, you're trying to put together this 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 puzzle when you have so little, and you're desperately clinging on to little clues. Mm. And from those clues, using a simple possible explanation to understand. And now with modern uh, technology, as as Flint was trying to express that you can use large amounts of data mm. that's like imperfect, but just the scale and using that to reconstruct civilizations. There are different practices from the little details of uh, what kind of things they eat, how they interact with each other, what kind of art they create to when they existed, what are the time frames, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And that starts to fill in the gaps of our understanding, but still the error bars are large in terms of what really happened. And that leaves room for things like Graham Hancock talks about, like lost civilizations, which I like also because it gives, you have a, a kind of humility about maybe there's giant things we don't know about or we got completely wrong. And that's always good to like remember. It's confusing to me to imagine like what, I don't even know what, like what ended the, why, where'd the Egyptians go? Like what happened to, <laughs> it yeah. seemed like they were doing so good. They had so much cool shit. Um, but I mean, I was reading anthropological stuff in the Amazon about about tribes that, you know, just through through their societal structures and through their hunting practices that that didn't really develop practices that worked and kind of bands of people that went extinct before they could turn into larger societies. And and there's there's a lot of people that got it wrong, you know, for every explorer that 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 leaves Borneo and arrives in South America, there's probably hundreds, hundreds more that just die at sea, get eaten by sharks, you yeah. know, avalanche. And it's just, it's so fascinating to me that we, all of us really past our grandparents don't really even know where we came from. Like, do you yeah. know who your great, great, great grandparents no. are? Like, no. I mean, there, there's methods of trying to figure that out, but really, mm. again, the air bars are so large that it's almost like we trying to create a narrative that yeah. makes sense for us. You know that I'm I'm ten percent Neanderthal, therefore I can bench press this much, mm. and uh, therefore my aggressive tendencies have a explanation. When in reality, there's so much diversity of personalities that they they <laughs> uh, far overshadow any possible histories we might have. Your aggressive tendencies don't have any explanation. You're <laughs> no, you need to. Sh you listen to me right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't hit me again. Don't choke me out again. <laughs> 